Okay. Welcome to the left groups in the European Parliament and our press conference this morning on the situation of Brexit with the EU summit, but also the impact on the uh, Irish peace accord. We're joined by, sadly online, uh, for, by both our guests, Martin Sjödervan, who is the co-president of the, of the group here in the European Parliament, but also a member of the UK coordination group, uh, which deals with the fallout of the UK leaving the European Union. We're also joined from Dublin by Mary Lou McDonnell, president of Sinn Féin. Uh, we'll let them both say a few words and then we'll take questions from journalists. So if you need to uh, ask a question, just go to Skype and type in the word uh, Foxbox EP and then leave a message and we'll put you in the waiting room. Uh, Martin, I'll let you go. Yes, um, thank you very much, Ben, and welcome everyone to this press conference where we want to take stock of the state of play of negotiations um, ahead of the council meeting today and tomorrow. And I'm very glad that um, we have Mary Lou MacDonald with us today, uh, leader of the largest party in Ireland, Sinn Féin, uh, because we will um, set a special focus on the situation in Ireland. And as you can see, we all have to adjust to the circumstances we are living in nowadays. That's why both of us have to attend this press conference remotely. I hope that everything will work out fine uh, well with the, um, with the technic, uh, technical uh, yes, challenges and, and things we have to deal with. All right, the left group in the European Parliament, GUE NGL, played an important role in putting the peace process uh, on the agenda for the Brexit negotiations. And together with our Sinn Féin comrades, we made sure that the EU understood why border infrastructure wasn't an option in Ireland. And we, the left in the European Parliament, together with Sinn Féin, secured that the European Union committed to uphold the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts. And we were the first to propose the North of Ireland remain in the single market in the customs union. We maintained a focus on the rights of people in the North of Ireland, including their right to be British or Irish or both. And we were also the one group in the European Parliament that from an early stage warned that the British government track records and the government of Boris Johnson here especially meant that they could not be trusted. And today we are here ahead of the European Council meeting because unfortunately we were right. The British government have not acted in good faith. They have not acted in good faith on the Irish protocol. Their internal market bill is a clear violation of the protocol and the Good Friday Agreement. And they are not acting in good faith in the negotiations on the future relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union. They have completely renounced the political declaration they agreed, uh, agreed to along with the withdrawal agreement. They are refusing serious level playing field measures. They are refusing historical fishing rights to neighboring coastal states and above all they are refusing to be legally bound by an agreement they make with the European Union in the future and I want to be very clear here we have always respected the right of the British to leave the European Union we have always respected the result of the Brexit referendum however it is not their right to keep all of the benefits of the EU, EU membership while acting against the interests of the other member states. And if they put at risk the fishing communities in neighboring coastal countries, then they have no right to expect that those countries provide tariff-free or quota-free access to their markets for British goods or free access for British services. And if they put at risk hundreds of thousands of jobs in the European Union by undercutting EU labor standards and environmental standards, then they have no right to expect the European Union to allow them to do so without taking measures to protect jobs and economy. The British government, to be clear again here, has no right to damage the peace process in Ireland. They have no right to break international law and they have no right to use the peace process in Ireland as a bargaining chip in the negotiations on the future relationship with the European Union. We, 
The left and the European Parliament, together with our comrades from Sinn Féin, will stand with the people of Ireland, North and South, in order to defend the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement in its entirety. The European Parliament, our group will not ratify any agreement which lower labor standards, environmental standards, or climate objectives. We will not ratify any agreement which puts at risk the jobs and livelihoods of millions of workers in the EU, and we will not ratify any agreement where the British government continues to threaten the peace process in Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement, and the Irish Protocol. And now I'm very glad again uh, to welcome you, Mary Lou, uh, and to give the floor to you. You are not only the leader of the opposition to an incoherent three-party government in Dublin, you are quite possibly also a future Taoiseach in Ireland, and I'm very glad to have you with us today. Thank you very, very much for that uh, warm and comradely introduction, Martin. I'm, I'm most appreciative of it. And a very good morning to all of you from uh, the Parliament here in Dublin. Um, can, I, can I firstly record uh, my and our gratitude for the very proactive way in which GUE uh, NGL, the, the left uh, in the European Parliament, have placed the issue of peace in Ireland, protection of the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts, very much front and centre in the in the political agenda. I want to I want to thank uh, again you for that support. I also want to recognise across the European Parliament the goodwill, the solidarity that has been demonstrated to Ireland in the midst of a Brexit debacle, which is bad news for all of us. Uh, it, it's bad news for the whole uh, continent. And can I also record um, our uh, appreciation of Michel Barnier and his team, who have, in a very thoroughgoing and I believe a very honourable way, stepped uh, their way through what is a very difficult, very, very difficult situation. Uh, Mr. Barnier understands Ireland, places a premium on the Irish peace process. Oh, and if only that Boris Johnson and the Tory government were similarly minded. They're not, and I'll come to that in, in due course. Uh, at the outset, it's important to, to remind ourselves that there, there is no good Brexit for us. There is no good outcome from this. We absolutely respect the right uh, of Britain if, if they wish to Brexit from the European Union. That is, their, that is their right, although I would say, and we have said from the beginning, uh, that any critique of the European project, and there are many, I, I hold a, a critical view in many, very many respects myself, uh, but it has to be said and recorded again that a Tory Brexit was not the answer and is not the answer to any of those important political and social uh, questions. Um, we are very mindful of the fact that our peace process that has been painstakingly built and sustained over generations now is put in real and imminent uh, threat by Brexit. Uh, we are very determined that there cannot be any uh, infrastructure of a border or any hardening of the border on our island. Uh, people should know and, and recall that our island now uh, is almost a century partitioned. We don't have the scope this morning for me to rehearse the history of that, save to say that the consequences of partition were very grave for all of our people. Uh, and that people have endured and suffered much. And so uh, the precious nature of our peace process has to be understood. And anything that threatens that uh, is utterly unacceptable for us. And I'm pleased to say unacceptable for our colleagues uh, at a European level and has been challenged very vigorously by um, senior political figures in the United States uh, of America, and I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with all of that. The agreement that was struck and the understanding that was uh, reached uh, has been 
that the Good Friday Agreement will be protected and, as Martin has critically said, in all of its parts. Uh, the reality that we find ourselves facing today is not just actions of British bad faith, um, but actions that are extremely reckless and potentially calamitous for the island of Ireland and for our peace process. Uh, Boris Johnson, the serving British Prime Minister, said to his own parliament and his own people that he had reached and achieved a deal that he called oven ready. Uh, he seems to have changed his position on that. The British system is advancing and has advanced legislation which they tell us breaches international law um, and they seem to be intent on proceeding with that. I'm very pleased that the European system has instigated uh, legal proceedings against Britain in that regard. I think that has to be pursued and I think the British government and British Prime Minister has to be convinced to step back from that very, very dangerous precipice and not to pl place uh, in danger uh, the Good Friday Agreement, the stability and the economic safety and security of our uh, island. Um, I want to also remind you that people in the north of Ireland didn't vote for Brexit. In fact, they voted to remain. I want to recall also uh, that the European system at the highest level has said that if at a future point the uh, island of Ireland is reunified, well then the North will automatically and seamlessly re-enter uh, the European Union system. The border in Ireland now because of Brexit, I believe, is no longer just an Irish problem. This is now truly a European problem. Our border is vast, it's porous. Um, in some circumstances, in many circumstances, you can have farm farms where the farmer might live and reside on one side of the border, but the land that they farm could cut across both jurisdictions. You have countless thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people who live, who work, who seek out treatment and services and education on either side uh, of the border. The border, in other words, would be impossible to regulate and police from the perspective of protecting the integrity of the European single market. And we don't want Ireland to become a conduit or a dumping ground for counterfeit goods or substandard uh, products. Uh, moreover, we don't want to be caught in the crossfire of a British manoeuvre to run down social and environmental standards in, in a race to the bottom that they very well may pursue uh, post Brexit. But above all else, above all other things, we cannot tolerate a situation where the political and social stability that we have achieved on the island is undermined. For decades, border crossings and roads on our island were closed because of the conflict that ensued for a very long time. The most tangible I suppose, and most powerful metaphor for peace in Ireland has been that we have dissolved that border and that there is now free and open movement right across our island. We cannot concede uh, on that. And therefore, we ask the European system in all of its parts to retain that position of solidarity with us, not to blink and not to give way to Tory bad faith, but rather to stand our ground uh, collectively. Um, the Good Friday Agreement contains a provision for a referendum on Irish unity, and those of you who know about uh, my party, Sinn Féin, will know that we are the party of Irish freedom and unity, uh, and we work every day um, towards securing that referendum and winning it and actually resolving the problem for all of us, in other words, removing uh, the border. That, uh, that possibility is provided for within the Good Friday Agreement, and I believe we will have a referendum in the years to come. And of course, it is our job through preparation and goodwill, effective dialogue uh, and creative and dynamic politics to win 
that referendum. So I'm very glad to be part of this uh, press conference this morning, um, and I look forward to your comments and your questions. And thank you again, Martin, for, for the warm introduction that you have given me. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Mary Lou, and thank you, Martin. Of course, this uh, press conference takes place because the EU summit starts today and Brexit is very much on the agenda. But today, 15th of October, was supposed to be the deadline that Boris Johnson had set himself. Uh, but it looks like nothing will come by. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, Skype and uh, Foxbox EP, and uh, we'll put you in the waiting room. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I see one question here. Yeah. Catherine Fior. Hi, uh, Catherine Fior, EU reporter. Uh, my, my first question is for, for Martin. Uh, you've said that uh, you don't want to see any compromise on fishing and things like that, but given you know, w whether you know, you know, the UK position it may be in bad faith, um, it may be very lamentable, but you know, you, you st we still have to deal with them, and if there is no compromise, then there's no deal. And if there's no deal, then the border will be a very hard border, which is also something that you don't want to see. So I'm just wondering, is there any room for compromise there, given that the consequences would be a very hard border? And more generally, can you just tell us a bit more about the view within the Parliament's liaison group uh, about the situation? and? really the lack of movement from, from the UK. And if I may, a uh, couple of questions for um, uh, Mary Lou MacDonald. Um, uh, if, it, if we are in a no-deal situation, do you think that, the, uh, that Ireland needs to be preparing contingency arrangements at this moment? I mean, it's very difficult, like you say, to see how you can police that border, especially since there are now many crossings, not like in the past. So how would that work? Um, do you have to prepare for that? Um, and do you think, especially if there are tariff differentials, there's a real risk of increased smuggling, which is linked to paramilitary activities? Is that a concern? And you mentioned the border poll. So um, like you say, it is in the Good Friday Agreement, but could that make things even more volatile at this moment, given that it's going to be a moment of tremendous change already uh, for Northern Ireland? Uh, you know, when do you envisage this border poll taking place? In a couple of years, three years? Um, just if you could maybe say something about that. Thank you. Maybe Martin first? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. So, and first of all, to be also clear about this, uh, a no agreement or a hard economic Brexit by the end of the year was, would be the most harmful result for both sides. This is clear. And that's why we are still demanding that there is some substantial progress on all the critical points like level playing field, but you referred especially to fisheries, but also when it comes to the question of governance. I think the best compromise uh, with regards to fisheries would be that we just stick to the co uh, status quo ante, meaning there is free access for the British fishery industry to the European markets without any tariffs and without any quota, and there is access for the European fishery industry to use um, the British seas. And uh, the second question when it comes to the more general assessment of the parliament and the liaison group, the UK coordination group in the parliament, uh, which consists of um, all the political groups in the parliament, well, I can only speak on my behalf, but I, I'm very concerned about uh, the lack of willingness uh, to move substantially uh, from the British side on all these open questions and um, conflictual topics that we have to deal with. And I'm not quite sure if there actually is the will on the British side and uh, on the British in the British government and um, um, if Boris Johnson actually goes for a deal or if he is not from the very beginning focusing on a result that means a hard economic Brexit by the end of the year. But we will see this within the next two weeks. Uh, once again, um, a hard economic Brexit would be the worst result for both sides. 
but um, there has to be some substantial movement from the British side uh, in order to overcome the impasse we are in right now. Mary Lou? Yes, and uh, I agree. Obviously, a, a no deal uh, result is, is the worst possible uh, scenario. Um, a worst scenario again is a no deal uh, result minus the Irish protocol, you know, minus the, the honouring of, of those uh, provisions. So I, I think, um, as you noted, Ben, today was supposed to be the day on which, um, you know, all would balance in, in terms of an agreement being met. That has gotten pushed out again. This obviously will go literally to the wire. I think there is still a possibility for a, an agreement to be found. Um, the question will be, um, whether or not uh, the British system can be convinced to actually move its uh, position in two respects. Firstly, to honour agreements already made. So let me make it clear. You can't be in the business of compromising on matters that have been concluded. We, we simply can't do business that way. And the matters of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol are settled. They are decided matters. That's item number one. And then secondly, on, on the other outstanding issues in terms of level playing pitch and fisheries, governance uh, and so on, uh, there will have to be a level of creativity. There will have to be a level of give from the British system. And I suspect if we are to judge by their, their previous uh, form, that that will only come very, very late in the day. That, that's my, my assessment uh, of matters. But as to the question to, 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 to myself, you know, a, a no deal outcome is a real possibility. Um, and a, a bad outcome for, for Europe, for Ireland, for sure. But I would argue also for Britain. I think that's bad news all, all around. Uh, and how do you plan? How, how do you build in contingencies for such a scenario? Well, I, I think uh, all of politics across our island has been talking for a long time uh, around what those contingency, contingencies might look like in the immediate aftermath of such a scenario economically. Uh, we had a budget here in Dublin, which was a matter of some controversy, uh, but certainly for all of us, from whichever political perspective we were coming from, we all uh, laid out our proposals and our plans mindful of the possibility of a, of a no deal uh, Brexit. So to some extent, that has been um, factored into the political planning. But I, I think we are in such unprecedented times that there aren't precise contingencies that can be put in place. Uh, I can, however, say this, that there cannot be and there will not be a hardening of the border in Ireland. We are all agreed on that. That would be a, a, a dramatic and a, a highly dangerous and reckless step backwards. So in a scenario where we have a no deal situation, I believe that we would have to seek and secure derogations um, from the European system to allow free and open trading across our island to see off uh, the the real threat that uh, border infrastructure would would uh, pose um, and I think in that scenario the referendum on unity to which I uh, referred really comes into very very direct and immediate uh, political focus because the answer to the problematic and contested border is to remove it the answer to the fact that uh, Ir Irish people voting in Ireland, in the north of Ireland, voted to remain, and some British people too, by the way, um, is to allow for a choice for, for many people, not just for a partitioned Ireland or a united Ireland, but whether or not uh, which union actually serves your, your economic, your social and your political welfare. Um, the UK or the European Union. And those are very, very live debates, by the way, in Ireland at this time. That com those conversations have started. 
when will the referendum happen? Uh, for me, uh, as soon as we are prepared to hold it, and, and by that I mean that there is clear preparation work that needs to be done. I think Brexit demonstrates very, very dramatically uh, that you do not go to the people asking a question to which you do not have the answers. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I've said to the Taoiseach, uh, who will be at the summit, of course, today, Michal Martin, and to his predecessor, Leo Varadkar, that really those preparations need to start now. There will be no prizes or, or nothing to be gained by bury, burying their heads in the sand. So that preparation work needs to start now. But, but certainly, um, in the event, and I hope it's it's not what happens, but in the event that we have a hard Brexit, a no-deal Brexit, a disorderly Brexit, um, well then certainly I, I think that that will uh, put further impetus and pace into the necessity for the referendum. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, Martin has to go to a meeting now, but if there are any follow-up questions here... Very short question. Ma uh, Catherine, go on. Yeah. Maybe just to Mary Lou then. Okay. If Martin has to go. Well, maybe if Martin could answer, I'd be grateful. But um, Mar uh, Michael Gove has said that the provisions that are in breach of uh, the withdrawal agreement are um, there as a safety net. Uh, this week, Simon Coveney uh, said that he thinks, that, uh, and the other ministers believe, that um, if a deal is reached, those provisions will have to be removed. Um, is that what you will demand? Is, is it enough that they just become redundant and unused uh, parts of the law, or do you, will you insist uh, that they, uh, they, they be removed from the statute books in the UK? Ben, if you just give me 30 seconds and then I have to leave, I have to apologize. I have another meeting at um, 12. Um, well, our position has been very clear about the internal market, but it's not only a violation of international law, it's also a violation of trust and the European Union cannot be blackmailed into an agreement with that internal market bill by the British. And um, the British are not only violating international law, disregarding um, the agreements already been found in the past, but also threatening the peace process. So yes, they have to be removed, these parts, very clear. Thank you, Martin. I, to Mary Lou, I don't know if you want to, uh, you want to, answer, want to answer that question as well. Yeah, just, yeah well, just to reiterate that point, um, you know, something is, is either on the statute books or it's not. I mean, the, the, the notion that you leave uh, you, need, you leave legal instruments on the statute to fall into abeyance is, is totally unacceptable. I mean, we have very clearly sought the upholding of international law and internationally binding uh, agreements. And we also, by the way, seek the protection of the law um, internationally um, to vindicate the rights of Irish uh, citizens and British citizens living on this island. And by the way, EU citizens too. Uh, and as to Mr. Goh's claim, a bizarre claim, that their violation uh, is, is done to protect the Good Friday Agreement, I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. Not alone does it, it raise the prospect of uh, a hardening of the border in, in ways that have been described before, but, but it uh, overrides um, and undermines the European Convention on Human Rights. I mean, a key a key foundation stone of the Good Friday uh, settlement. And it also, by the way, is, uh, is an attack on devolution itself, because it allows, it allows Parliament at Westminster, the government, to override and to intrude on powers that have been devolved to Belfast, and by the way, to the other devolved institutions. So the only, the only uh, thing that this uh, led interests of Tory Brexiteers and English nationalism. Thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, our time is up and uh, we send you our best regards. Uh, in